All right, we are talking about planning a meeting. So now, now we're getting into more details, more specifics of why we do what we do. So what I want to talk to us about is not so much, you know, here's the foundations of worship, uh, here's how music works in worship, congregational meetings, but what, do we, what are we doing in our meetings? Why? How do we put these together? And does it matter? So that's what I want to talk about. That's what we're going to talk about. So the Christians that should meet, the, the conviction that Christians should meet weekly is almost universally taught in practice. Now, I would say there's convincing evidence that it be on a Sunday because it's the Lord's Day. But there are some who would say, no, it's a Saturday. And some who would say it really doesn't matter. But it seems there is a precedent set in Jesus rising from the dead on the first day of the week, and that's what we're celebrating. That's what we're remembering. Now, even though everybody might, most people might agree that we should meet, what we don't agree on is what we should do when we gather. And there are various things that have influenced or determined what we do that influence our decisions. The first is Scripture, obviously the most important. The commands, the models, the inferences. And are you guys familiar with the regulative principle? Have you heard that? anybody heard that term? The regulative principle is a phrase that came about as the result of the Westminster Confession, where they said you cannot... It, they were coming out of the Roman Catholic Church, and they were trying to figure, what do we do with our meetings? What do we do, like... What can we carry on from what the Mass did? And, and what should be different? What's okay to do? What's not okay to do? So they determined that we can only do what's commanded in Scripture or inferred by Scripture through, through model or example. Anything else is forbidden. So they were addressing things like sign of the cross, holy water, veneration of the Eucharist, all those kinds of things. They were saying, praying to saints. They are saying, you can't do that because it's not in the Bible. So that's the regulative principle. And Presbyterians generally function. Do you have Presbyterian churches here? Any? There are some, but not a lot. Yeah. Um, they would, most of them would be regulative principle. At least conservative ones would be for sure. The problem with the regulative principle is that we can't quite figure out everything that Scripture tells us to do. So some people will use the regulative principle to say that we should only sing the Psalms. And actually, we aren't only singing the Psalms. We're singing metrical versions of the Psalms, which is different. But they insist that the songs we're to sing have to be given to us by God. Well. The only place those are is in the Psalms, so you can't sing any hymns. And for a while, in the Western Church, late 1600s, maybe during the 1600s, most churches only sang metrical psalms. Um, and it wasn't until late 1600s, 1700s, that churches began accepting hymns that weren't built, that weren't derived directly from the psalms. Uh, so scripture is one place we get it. Traditions, Orthodox Church, Pentecostal Church, there are traditions. Start a new Pentecostal Church, hardly have to think about it. You just do what everybody else is doing. You do what we've been doing for dozens of years, hundreds of years. Experiences, that's another reason that we change things about our meeting. This doesn't seem to be affecting me. Culture, how people understand what we do, that should influence what we do in our gatherings. And while God hasn't given us a specific order, there is, as we've already seen, there's a connection between God glorifying public gatherings and the spiritual health of his people. They feed on each other. If you have a meeting that's God glorifying, you'll tend to have people who are living lives that are God glorifying, and vice versa. If you have people who are living God-glorifying lives, you'll tend to have a church that is a service that is God-glorifying. 
I'm going to look at the significance of our gatherings, like why they're so important. And we've talked some about this, but I want to, I want to look more specifically, more, more carefully. Liturgy is the word we use to describe what we do when we get together. Literally, it's a work on behalf of the people. It came to be used as the public way a church honors God in its gatherings. It's used in the New Testament to describe the ministry that Christians can have to one another, and it's based on the unique work of Christ on their behalf. So we're not adding anything to what Christ has done. We are working with what Christ has done. So here's why that's so important. Here's why what we do in our meetings is so important. First, liturgy models things. Carl Truman said, you can tell a lot about people's theology from what they do in church. Well, let's just think about that for a second. What can you tell about the Pentecostal church's theology from what they do in church? What does it say? What is, actually, let, tell me some of the things that you see in a typical Pentecostal church. Okay, a lot of experiences. Okay, that tells you about their theology. How about, is there uh, preaching of God's word that clearly communicates the context and the meaning of a passage? Do you see that? Okay, so that tells you something about their theology. So every, every meeting tells something about our theology. So the forms, the structures, the emphases, the activities, the elements, all those things tell us how to think about and relate to God, how to pray, how to sing. We're telling people this is how you should pray, this is how you should sing, how to relate to Scripture, how to think about it, and how to relate to each other. So that's what Scripture models, I mean liturgy models. McDonald, did you say? It's, it's becoming clear to me that my role is to encourage gospel-centered, theologically driven, Christ-exalting, musically accessible, emotionally engaging songs for the church, like in, in other languages. I mean, I think in English work, we're, we're doing great. But you got the Gettys, you got City of Light, you got us, you got, I and mean, those are the big three, but I, I know there are other people who are seeking to do that. But what you just said, it, it just makes me think, man, we got work to do. <laughs> we, got, we, got, we got songs to translate. We got songs to write. We got, yeah, we got to get them out there. We got, it, it, it involves training our churches, not simply to love feelings about the truth, but to love the truth. That's a different thing. We can love feelings about the way it makes me feel, the way the gospel makes me feel, the way God's blessings make me feel, rather than the God who's behind those blessings, who is the greatest blessing of all. All right, we got work to do. All right, liturgy models, liturgy teaches, through sermons, through songs, through repetition, things we continue to do over and over. That's teaching our people. Liturgy shapes and influences. So as we plan and order our services, as Mike Cosper, discerning the content to include, we shape the beliefs, and devotional lives of our church members. So anything we give value to is going to influence us. It's going to shape us. If there's something that you love, sports, um, are there sports? What would be the sports here? Football, soccer? Our soccer, football? Uh, any others that are really popular? R racing, running? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we have way too many sports in America. Just people give hours and hours and hours to this thing that, uh, yeah, it just, it shapes and influences you. Whatever you do repeatedly shapes, influences you. Psalm 115.8 says, those who make them idols become like them. So do all who trust in them. So we become like what we worship but we also become like how we worship. That means culturally hip, 
trendy services tend to produce culturally hip, trendy Christians. Um, happy, prosperity-driven, exciting meetings tend to think people that think, t tend to produce people that think the only way I know God is with me is if my life is going amazing and I'm happy. That's what it, that's what it produces. Dry intellectual services, which sometimes can be the overreaction to Pentecostal, tends to produce dry intellectual Christians. S meetings that are driven by emotional highs tend to produce emotionally driven Christians. That's the assurance that God is with me. My emotions are <laughs> excited. Thoughtful, biblically informed, emotionally engaging, gospel-rich services tend to produce that kind of Christian. So what we do in our services really matters. It's worth fighting for. So here's a couple thoughts about these things. Corporate worship is more than a song set. Do you have that phrase here? Like a set, the set of music? Do you use that? No? Set, no? Yeah, A.B. Des. Okay, great. It's one thing to put together a group of songs. It's another thing to weave songs together in a thoughtful, intentional, Christ-exalting way with other things, scripture, prayer, exhortations, testimonies, a sermon, communion. That's another thing. The songs are just a part of what we're doing. They're not a separate thing. Songs are meant to tell part of the story. They don't tell the whole story. They're limited. Because of the way songs are constructed, they're limited, they're limited in their theological specificity and their breadth. So songs can't cover as much ground as words because they have to function within the confines of melodies and meter and chord progressions. There's a beginning and an end. So you, you just can't do with everything with songs. You do some things, but you can't do everything. You need all the other stuff. Songs teach, but they aren't sermons. They don't unpack uh, the Bible verse by verse. And if they did, they wouldn't be very good songs um, because of that affectional aspect. They're, they're meant to produce that affection and, and work at that with the words so that we hear the truth, we feel the truth. That's what they're doing. So songs need other things around them to make the most effective. Another point, don't let music trump theology. And this, is, this kind of gets back to one of the things we were talking about earlier, about the songs we have to choose from. And, and here too, Amharic, um, when people say, hey, can we just do a song in, that we feel is right? You know, it's our, it's our heart language. Those are good considerations, but they can't be more important than our theology. The, our theology, our knowledge of God, drives everything. So in the States, sometimes we'll have churches with large choirs and orchestras, and they won't do any songs that aren't, don't have choir and orchestra parts. That's letting your musicianship, your musicians drive your theology. There's a song we'd love to sing. Ah, we can't do it because it's not, we don't have the choir arrangement. We don't have the orchestra arrangement. Well, do you think you could just do it with a piano? No, 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 no. No, we need the whole band. Um, a church whose music leader only listens to contemporary music and, and knows that genre. But let's talk about what you guys deal with, which is songs in your native tongue. Those songs always need to thought, be thought, we always need to think about those songs in terms of how the content interacts with what's around it. So you never want to do a song simply because it's familiar, people like it, I can play it. Those are not the main concerns when you're thinking about what songs we want to do. We want to find that, that subset of songs that is in people's heart language, but also says what you want it to say. So that's what I mean by don't let music trump your theology. If your meetings are going to be planned on purpose, they can't be driven by the songs you sing. 
Songs are meant to serve the word. So we can't just go with, I want to sing this song, and then figure out what goes around it. Let's make those songs fit what we want to say. So we want to give churches songs they should be singing rather than being limited by musical considerations. Does that make sense? So the, the, the most important issue is, what does the song say? Then we look at, how does the song feel? Now, you want to get songs that do both. I mean, ideally, you want to sing songs that say exactly what you want to say, and, and people feel that in their heart. Because remember, the songs are meant to help us feel the truth. That's what they do. All right, values to cultivate. We've looked at these, so I'm not going to belabor them. Uh, God's word, a love for God's word, the gospel. Let me say this about the gospel. Three things we need to remember in presenting the gospel. It needs to be clear, it needs to be compelling, and it needs to be consistent. By clear, I mean clear. <laughs> we understand. Not reductionistic. Jesus died for my sins. That's reductionistic. Clear is we were condemned under the judgment of a righteous and holy God. We were rightfully sentenced to separation from him, punishment forever, because we chose to turn away from his good and gracious commands, his good and gracious will. We, turned, we chose to run from his presence. But God, in his mercy and kindness, determined from before the ages began to have the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, the Son of God, descend, take on our flesh, be born as a baby so we could live a perfect life that we never lived. No one on earth ever lived a perfect life but Jesus so that he could take our sins on himself at the cross, suffer separation from God, be punished in our place so that all who trust in him could know their sins are forgiven, that they have been cleansed, that they have been washed clean, and that they have been justified in the eyes of God, and that they are now declared righteous in God's eyes, and they have been set free from the power of sin. They are free to obey God. What is it? Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 ends with, Christ became for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Our righteousness, his perfect life is credited to us. We are forgiven. Our sanctification we are set apart as holy. We belong to God. We are adopted in our redemption. We are set free from the power of sin. We are no longer under the bondage of sin. That's what Christ did. He rose from the dead. He ascended to his Father's right hand. He reigns in glory where he's interceding for us, coming back one day for the bride he redeemed. That's the story we're presenting. We want to make sure that's clear for people. And it's not just about, well, Jesus died for me because he loves me so much. How could he not die for me? That's how it's presented sometimes. We want it to be compelling. That means that if we're not affected by the gospel, we aren't going to do a very good job presenting it to our people. Compelling means that when we gather, we aren't just giving lip service to the gospel. We aren't merely making sure that we get all our doctrine, doctrinal points right. We're moved by it. We're affected by it. We're, we're constantly amazed that Jesus, the Son of God, would come to die in our place. It's, it's truly amazing, and we want to make it compelling for people. We are rejoicing in the gospel we are expounding the gospel, marveling in the gospel, being astonished by the gospel. That's what we want to come across when we talk about it. And if we get to the place where we can't do that, it's time for a soul checkup. It's time to ask, do I, do I really believe this gospel? Have I forgotten how good it is? It's, it's really that good. So clear, compelling, and consistent. Just, we've talked about that. We just need it all the time. And then we're a spirit-filled community. We've talked about a number of these. Um, we'll just look at maybe 1 Peter 2. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, 
that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's who we are. And we've talked about the significance of the church gathering. That's what that is. So those are the specific emphases, the word of God, the gospel, that we're a spirit-filled community. So let's, let's break it down into what, what specific things has God said we're to do in our gatherings. So list a number of them here. Preaching, reading the scripture, give attention to the public reading of the scripture. And that, that's one that, you know, I think for years, for decades, we really didn't give attention to. The only time we read the scripture was like for the sermon. So just the idea of reading the scripture is, is something that, that we should give attention to. And it's not just reading the scripture, I would say, because Paul goes on to say, uh, he doesn't just say, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Well, the exhortation is the, is the explanation part. It's telling people what this means. There's no magic in just reading scripture. We want to help people. We want to give them the understanding. So reading the scripture, singing, absolutely. Prayer. Paul says, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands. Uh, supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving can be made for all people. I urge this. The Lord's Supper. Frequency to be determined by the local church elders. Baptism, financial giving, spiritual gifts, confessions of faith greeting each other. Because remember, when these letters were written, they were written to be read in the context of a meeting. So Paul's there saying, you know, uh, greet this person, greet that person. Uh, where is it? Well, Romans, he just goes this whole look, whole, whole group of people. Luke greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea, to Nympha, the church in her house. So what are we doing? We're just greeting. We're saying hi to each other. We're welcoming each other. Announcements, testimonies, dedications. Those are acceptable and profitable as we tie them into our purpose as a church. And, and we strive to make those connect to who we are as the church. So when we plan, how do we plan? Do we just like put a bunch of things in, in blocks and put them together? Well, I want to suggest that we plan progressively. We start at one place and we end up at another. And by planning progressively, I don't mean cutting edge. I mean, we want to plan in a way that, that feels like a journey. We start in one place, we end up in another. Some people call it a flow, which kind of, I don't know. Progression implies that there's a direction. We're, we're going someplace. David Peterson said, God gathers his people to himself as an act of grace. So when we come together, our intentions and actions need to be shaped by God's purpose in drawing us together. Every time we need, meet, we need to be reminded of the basis of our relationship with God and with one another. Every gathering should be gospel-shaped. So we've talked a little bit about that, the gospel progression. In his book, Christ-Centered Worship, um, Brian Chappell, his thoughts have been helpful to me. Uh, I grew up Catholic as I mentioned, and, you know, we went through the same liturgy every week until 1967 when there was something called Vatican II, and they, they gave us new ways of doing the Mass. Mass wasn't in Latin anymore. It was in English. It was in a language we could understand. And they gave us five different formats that we could use for the liturgy. And it was like, whoa, this is huge. This is massive. But over time, it just became this repetitive, rote, dead, dry ritual. That even, even as someone who wanted to enter in, wanted to be a part, wanted to be excited, it was just hard. So I, I think for a long time, I was very hesitant to even use the word liturgy. It was just like, ugh, liturgy, just so dead. And I just didn't want to use it. But liturgy just describes what we do in our meeting. That's all it is. So Brian Chapel writes, worship cannot be, and he's talking about congregational worship, 
cannot be simply a matter of arbitrary choice, church tradition, personal preference, or cultural appeal. There are foundational truths in the gospel of Christ's redeeming work that do not change if the gospel is to remain the gospel. So, if our worship structures are to tell this story consistently, then there must be certain aspects of our worship that remain consistent. So he walks through eight, and he, he uses examples of liturgy from throughout history and shows that there's a real similarity in the things that people chose to do. So these are the ones he listens, lists, lists. And they all have to do with God's grace. Adoration, which is a recognition of God's greatness and grace. Confession, an acknowledgement of our sin and need for grace. Affirmation of pardon, an affirmation of God's provision of grace. Thanksgiving, an expression of gratefulness for God's grace. Petition or intercession, acknowledgement of dependence on God's grace. Instruction, proclamation of God's grace. Communion or fellowship, celebrating the grace of union with Christ and his people. And then the charge or the blessing, benediction, living in the light of God's grace. It's a beautiful picture. And whether you structure your meeting exactly to look like that or contain those elements in various forms, it's very enriching. Chapel's point is there's a reason those things go in order. They're, it's not accidental. So we, we want to keep that in mind. Um, we could walk through various encounters of God with his people that that show those elements. Uh, God with, at Mount Sinai, the people of Mount Sinai, um, God with Isaiah in Isaiah 6, some of the ways that the letters are written. Ephesians begins with God's greatness and grace, acknowledgement of our sin, we are under wrath, assurance of pardon, thankfulness, petition, intercession, instruction coming in chapter 4, this is how we're to live, communion, the greeting of others, charge and blessing. I mean, it just follows that pattern through the letter. Put more simply, we could talk about God's glory, God's grace, our response. I like that. That, that just simplifies it. After Chapel's book came out, there were a lot of, there was a lot of pushback, as there always when, is when someone says something clearly. And people were, were saying, hey, um, are there different ways to do this? You know, can the gospel be told another way? And yeah, it can be told in other ways. We can start with the fact that we're forgiven and then go to why we needed to be forgiven. Um, and yeah, there are just different ways we can do it. We can start with a desire to follow the Lord and, and please Him um, and then realize we can't do that but then realize that Jesus did that for us and we receive grace through him and return to where we started. Different ways of doing it. So that's what David Peterson was attempting to say in his book, Encountering God Together. He says, Chapel rightly suggests that we should view corporate worship as nothing more, nothing less than a representation of the gospel in the presence of God and his people for his glory and their good. But the New Testament presents the gospel in different ways to inform and challenge Christians in different contexts. Different passages could influence a range of service patterns, taking us on different spiritual and emotional journeys. In this way, we could experience both familiarity and variety in our weekly gatherings. I really appreciate him saying that. When we planted the church in Louisville, uh, 12 years ago, we followed a liturgy before that that was pretty specific, but we never called it a liturgy. The liturgy was this. People would be in the room, 
kind of talking and everything, and then the band would start playing. Eventually, people would start singing with us, and we'd always start with a fast song. And then we would do another fast song, because one fast song was never enough. Two fast songs. Then we'd do a medium tempo song. And then probably somewhere in there, there'd be a prophetic word, or two, or three, maybe. And then we do two slow songs. Then we have welcoming the guests, announcements, and then the sermon, which would go anywhere from 50 minutes to an hour and 10. And then we would have probably a song and a time of ministry, the time that we prayed for people. We just invite people to come down, and it was a, um, yeah, it was, people would always come down, pray for, you know, whatever needs they had. So we had not only the pastors, but teams, people assigned to do that, pray for people. So it wasn't a free-for-all, it was, it was more intentional. When we got to Louisville, we could, we could start from scratch, and we thought, we don't need to do what we've been doing for the last 30 years. Let's consider what might be appropriate. So when we started, we started with a pretty strict, uh, pretty strict, how would I say it? Um, let me see, a, a pretty strict order that felt a little stiff. Um, it felt like, let me see, I'm going to, I'm going to show you exactly what we did. Um, this is a Google doc that, that where I keep all the order, are these things on? Yeah. All the, the order of every service that we've done for the last 12 years. So this is the back of the very beginning of the church. Uh, okay, so here we have our first meeting. We began with a song because we didn't think that anybody would be ready for a scripture at the beginning. We thought th that'd be too much. We, we, gotta, we just got to do what we've always done. Then we did uh, Psalm 145 and transitioned into how... <laughs> Seeing this holy God, this great God, makes us aware of our sins. So we did holy, holy, holy. Titus 3, we read it this morning. For we were once foolish, disobedient, those kinds of things. And then transitioned into our, our sins are paid in full. And now why this fear is a song we sang. Um, it's an old hymn set to new music. Uh, Jesus has paid the price for our sins. God can't demand that payment twice. Prayer of thanks. So there's the thanksgiving. Short intro to the offering. Brief prayer of gratefulness. Oh, an interview with the elders. <laughs> that what we didn't even preach that day. <laughs> Closing encouragement. Oh, my Redeemer's love. Then a benediction. So that, it was pretty stiff. And I think we did something similar the next week. And then the third week, uh, yeah, something similar again. Just we got a song, we got a call to worship, another song, God's holy, we need to be uh, forgiven. Hear and be reminded what God has done. Hear his love, how deep the Father's love for us, prayer of thanksgiving. So it was pretty, pretty straight, but then instrumental intro. Okay, here we start deciding we're going to start with the scripture. But to alert people that we're starting the meeting, we're going to play instruments. And that, that would draw people. People would say, oh, it's starting, it's starting. So people would start to come in, and, but we wouldn't sing a song. We would read a scripture. So we still do that to this day. So about two minutes before the meeting starts, band comes up, we start playing. People turn around. You know, and what we started doing now is we welcome the guests. We uh, welcome the guests, and then we do our call to worship. But people are like silent, and they're ready, and they're, they're listening. So that was just something that we did uh, to help the beginning. I'm just looking at, uh, we didn't do it there. So we weren't quite convinced. Whoa. Oh, wait. 
Yeah, so we went back to it. And we, we kept going back, for, back, back and forth, back and forth. What we've settled on is, uh, it's pre-220. What we've settled on is a, this format. Um, so the guy, let's see, I don't know if this is, yeah, they were supposed to have planned this already, but it doesn't look like they did. <laughs> um, so a call to worship, two songs, all praise to him. It's a, uh, it's a song of adoration. Uh, Rejoice is a song that uh, talks about what Jesus has done, but also talks about our sufferings. And then the scripture reading more has to do with uh, we have been given a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, according to his great mercy. So then we sang a song that's kind of confessional, Jesus, your mercy. Um, and then Jesus, there's no one like you, which is saying, it's basically a prayer of thankfulness, a song of thankfulness. We do a pastoral prayer because we've walked through the gospel. Why wouldn't we want to approach God with our requests? So that's what we do there. And uh, there wasn't a PC testament, actually. And then we had the message, Galatians 2, followed up by a song and a benediction. That's pretty much what we do most Sundays. Um, it allows us to have some flexibility, but uh, some repetition as well. Because if you're creative every week and no one knows exactly what you're going to do, uh, that, that's confusing. So what we've tried to do is have some structure that allows for planning and spontaneity. That's how we've thought through it. There are some Sundays where we, we do something pretty different, uh, like when we add, incorporate new members uh, or we, we send off the pastor's college. Um, there'll be different, different things we do. We always have the call to worship, the benediction, always have preaching, pretty much always have a pastoral prayer. So those are the things we always get in there. Now, the next point is just planning contextually. Our churches, our gatherings don't take place in a vacuum. So we want to consider the things going on around us uh, in the broad context. What is the church experience this week? What was preached last week? What's the point of the message this week? We typically build our, ma our meetings on what took place last week. So as you saw in the meeting here, we just heard a message on why do we sing? Well, let's that, that call to worship be something about singing. Let's put that baby right into practice. Let's go for it. Um, so that's the context. And then we'll go from there. Narrow context is in your meeting, what's, what's right before what you're doing, what's right after what you're doing. That's the narrow context. And transitions, we're going to do a whole uh, session, next session on transitions, so I'm not even going to talk about that. But I will say this. I'll read this quote by Alan Ross. Today... In an age that seeks to simplify everything, songs, sermons, readings, and the ritual of the service, the clear and powerful proclamation of sound biblical doctrine and practice in every part of the, every part of the service will give spiritual depth to worship and demonstrate the vitality of the faith in the lives of the worshipers. Remember how we commented on Michael's transition uh, into communion, how he took from the message and, and showed how that applied to communion. That was so helpful. And that was just such a great illustration of how a transition, how a transition should work. We will talk more about transition, so we'll leave that. Plan creatively. One of the challenges we face when we're talking about how to plan our meetings is uh, boredom, ritual deadness you know we just we just do the same thing every week um we don't we don't want to do that <laughs> we, uh, john piper said i think to, has said to present the gospel in a boring way is sin and i think that's true we to, our meetings should never be boring now what makes them most exciting and moving is what what should make our meetings most exciting and moving? Hmm? Mm -hmm. 
Jesus, the gospel, the fact that the Lord is with us, we're not going to be the most exciting thing happening. But doesn't mean that we, we give ourselves over to just the same things every week. So I don't know if I wrote these ideas in your, in your outline or not. You can learn new songs. You can change a song structure, which some of you guys have been doing. You can change your instrumentation. You know, one time it's, it's the whole band. Another time it's just an acoustic guitar. You can involve people from the congregation. So we'll have people from the congregation come up and read the scriptures or give a testimony or pray at times. Read scripture during the songs. Project scripture during the songs. That's something I don't do too much, but others have done very effectively. Between verses of a song, just project a scripture. Or between two songs, project a scripture that gives people something to focus on. You don't need to say anything. It's just a creative way to bring people more into what you're doing. Using creeds, you've done that. Corporate prayer, where you pray something together. I don't typically use historic confessions because I find that often they make it sound like we aren't really forgiven. You know, we're pleading for God's mercy, pleading for God's mercy, pleading for God's mercy. And the assurance of pardon is like a totally different thing. Don't like that. I want people to know that we come confessing our sin, thanking God for his mercy. He's, it's not, his mercy isn't dependent on how many times we ask for it. His mercy is dependent on the fact that Jesus has come and died in our place. Have people share testimonies. If you want to bring about change in your church, have someone who has been changed come up front and share what happened. That's a great, great way of, of inspiring people, teaching people, modeling people. That includes conversions. You know, if someone has, they were converted 10 years ago out of drugs or out of uh, abusive merit relationship or out of just total debauchery, Share that, because there may be someone in your church at that meeting or someone who knows someone who's going through exactly that. So share testimonies. Um, the, there are boundaries to creativity. I didn't mention visuals. Visuals are way overrated. Uh, you can ask, you know, is there a better way to project the lyrics but adding moving pictures behind them is not a way of making them better. Um, creativity has boundaries, and I want to suggest three. Just like the water pipes in a house, or the banks of a river, or the shore of the ocean, as long as the water stays within its boundaries, it's really fruitful, helpful, and life-giving. But when that water overflows those boundaries, it's distracting and dangerous. So Leland Riken says, artists, like everyone else, are the recipients of grace. We've talked about artistry. <clears throat> We're talking about that at lunch. They are stewards of what has been given to them. God gave them the gift of artistic ability, not for unrestrained self-indulgence, but to glorify God and to serve their fellow humans. That's why he's given us creativity. So I like to say it like this. Creativity isn't something we do. It's a way we do something. Creativity isn't something we do. It's a way we do something. That something is to help them see the glory of God in Jesus Christ and understand what a difference it makes to their lives. So the limit, limiters of creativity are these, and then we'll take a break. Edification. Whatever we're doing creatively, does it build up everyone in the church? So, uh, you know, someone say a dance ministry. We talk about that. I can assure you, a dance ministry will not build up everyone in the church. Uh, it might be someone doing uh, a dramatic impression of something. Uh, don't know if that will build up everyone in the church. You just want to ask, will that really build up everyone in the church? Second, unity limiter. Do creative elements enable people from different generations, backgrounds, and classes to worship together, expressing our unity in the gospel, or do they drive people apart? So whatever creative thing I'm going to do, you know, um, maybe I'll do this song in a different way instrumentally, a cool way. Is everybody on board with that? Does, that? does that help bring the church together? Or does that just say, hey, look, we can do this song in a cool way? And the gospel limiter. Do creative elements distract from, distort, 
or demean the gospel? Or do they draw attention to its uniqueness and its beauty and its power? We can't make the gospel look better. We can only make the gospel clearer. That's all we can do, which is great, because the gospel is great enough. And if you do all these things, plan the, your meetings this way, these should be the five effects. Exaltation, God is glory, and the gospel should be elevated in our minds and hearts. Edification, God's people should be built up in the gospel. Exhortation, God's people should be stirred up to good works in response to and empowered by the gospel. Encounter, God's presence should be acknowledged and experienced as a primary benefit of the gospel. And then evangelism, unbelievers should be able to hear the gospel. So that's our aim, that's our goal in, in thinking about how we put together the meetings that we have. In the next session, we're going to look at not only the, the we, we look more at the uh, elements, like the specific things that we do. Next session, we're going to look at how to tie it all together.